Hello and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah, and I am so thrilled, completely and utterly thrilled, that we have Andrew Cartmel back on with us today to talk about, I want to say, the latest book in the Vinyl Detective series, except you have another book coming out in May, so I don't know if that's quite the correct terminology. So this is book five we're going to talk about, which is low action. I mean, I had to think for a moment there. <laughs> yeah, so that's book five, and then book six has been written, has been delivered, it's got some really great cover art, and is scheduled, you know, fingers crossed, for publication in May We've always published the Vinyl Detective books annually in May, but then when the pandemic hit, everything went to the wall. So it would be great to be back on track. Fingers crossed, because I'm looking forward to reading the next book. Thank you. Well, before we start discussing this book, let's start with just some some intro questions. Something great that's happened recently. Sarah? This might be a little bit of a cop-out, but honestly, returning to the Vinyl Detective uh, (laughs) series has been really delightful. This week has been a little rough, so it was nice to have something really to look forward to, both in terms of reading and recording. Uh, Sorry, if the question was for me next, because obviously it's all about me. I'm such a (laughs) good Something great. Well, I was recently ill. I actually was very lucky to escape COVID with, with very mild symptoms, but... I couldn't write. I just didn't, wasn't in the frame of mind for writing. I, I was on some level, I was kind of mentally exhausted for quite a while, but I'm back in the writing now. And that is, I suppose, amongst a bunch of great things that have been happening, that might be the greatest because I've, I've just kind of got my mojo back. And at the moment I'm mostly writing, I am working on a couple of novels, a new vinyl detective, and also a kind of um, a new series, which is part of the vinyl detective universe, but Ooh. it isn't actually vinyl detective. But Principally lately, I've been writing stage plays, and I've been loving that. I've just finished a new one, and I had it read by some great actors. So that's all. Oh, that's incredibly exciting, and we we are going into production. We're actually putting a play on uh, May the second next year uh, in Southwest London. So if anybody is over here, then please come and see the play. It's yeah. So that's that's been tremendously exciting, tremendously good fun, and and sort of as part of that, I've just got. One of my writing heroes is Aaron Sorkin, who you might know from The West Wing and Social Network and Steve Jobs. And he's just done a new movie for Netflix called The Child of Chicago 7, which I haven't seen, but I discovered the script was in print. You could buy the book of the script. And I've been reading that. Now, that's just been such a thrill. So I suppose reading and writing have been my principal joys of late. And they are wonderful, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is all in the context of, you know, it's... I, it's lovely to sit out in the garden with a cat and, uh, you know, have a nice meal and see your friends and all, all of these things. But writing is central to my life and reading is too, because that's how I came to writing. That's how I came to my love of writing was initially as a reader. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've bounced back and are now in it full force because that means more books for us. <laughs> yes. No complaints here. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I do love the Vinyl Detective series and it's really a huge incentive to know that there are people out there who who are waiting for the books. Well, my great thing is that we bought some trellises. They're not up yet. That's actually what I plan on doing later today. But I'm on a journey to turn my backyard into the kind of place where you're afraid of being kidnapped by Faye. (laughs) Uh, And trellises for grapevines is my first step. (laughs) So I'm excited to get those up. That means digging a lot. So yeah. Well, yeah, gardening is really so rewarding. I mean, I, I don't want to turn this into a gardening po- podcast. But something I've discovered <laughs> is that, you know, you spend a little bit of time, a little bit of money, and mm-hmm. you just reap years of pleasure from it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I just planted some tulip bulbs, which are not immediately rewarding, but I'm so looking yeah. forward to, to February. You have to understand the principle of deferred gratification to be a gardener. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's everyone drinking this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world? <laughs> I, I I know I keep harping on about it, but when I was ill a little while ago, I just lost my taste for alcohol completely. And it kind of hasn't come back. And I was talking to one of the actresses in the play and she doesn't drink at all. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And I thought, I'll give it a try. So I, I, I was very much, a, as Sarah knows, I'm a big fan of like fine wine. So I've sort of set that kind of drinking aside but I'm still a major fan of high-end hot chocolate by which I mean Mm. the really serious you know like (laughs) small production cacao from certain parts of the the world uh, single estate hot chocolates 
So I've been really loving that. And it's so I guess the last thing that I had I was a Hotel Chocolat peanut butter hot chocolate. And it was really good. Oh, that sounds that incredible. That does sound good. And this <laughs> is the right weather for hot chocolate, too. Yes. The right time of year for hot chocolate. So. I agree, but it's never stopped me. In the middle <laughs> of summer, in a heat wave, has never stopped me having a hot chocolate. I'm say. That's true. Chocolate milk doesn't have the same vibe as hot chocolate. No, no I, I think it brings out. I think being warmed brings out more of the flavor. I'm not sure if there's any scientific basis for this, but I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Sarah, we're both drinking tea, I believe. What What is your variety today? I am drinking a pumpkin spice black tea, something Ooh. like that. I don't actually remember what exactly. Me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what have we <you> done? <laughs> we're, we're clearly on the same wavelength today. And I think unlike our hero in the Vinyl Detective books, we are not dumping out our tea in the garden, <laughs> which is something that he does in this book. And I noticed and was appalled because I am <laughs> I am a tea lover. <laughs> Yeah, he's definitely a coffee star, but which is one of the things I, I did to make him somewhat different from me. I, I'm sort of the hot chocolate equivalent of, of the, the co his coffee snobbery, which is useful because when I say I drink hot chocolate, people are like, "Oh, do you have marshmallows in it?" It's not like that. Like this is this is long time. and it, it's the sort of drink that actually gives you a buzz the way coffee does. So I can write I can write about the physical effects of coffee because I, I know something similar. And I got a friend mm -hmm. who's a coffee nut who reads my manuscript. She said, oh, that, that, that description of like the craving for coffee is exactly <laughs> what it's like. And in fact, it's just me craving for a really good hot chocolate, you know, a high cocoa content hot chocolate for that hit. Oh, you spend the entire book teasing us with wonderful descriptions of food and beverages. And it's mm -hmm. really not fair at all. <laughs> I am a foodie. And as I say, I, I know a little bit about wines. And so all that business with Nevada being a wine not and our hero being a foodie that all comes from the heart and, and from my own personal knowledge well we have a few more questions on that vein later oh i'm drinking pumpkin spice chai with a spoonful of honey in it not unfortunately penny's honey uh, <laughs> that would be a very different podcast <laughs> that pops up in the next book too just so you know <laughs> oh i can't wait <laughs> so before we move on to talk about low action has anyone read anything great lately uh, well, I'll just jump in and, and, and boringly, I'll, I'll mention The Trial of the Chicago 7 by Aaron Sorkin again, which is the first of his movie scripts to be published. I didn't know that. Some of his TV scripts have been. But beyond that, I've been reading, I've gone into this kind of golden age Hollywood binge because I was out of action for a while. And so I was, sort of, and in fact, I haven't been, I'm a movie nut. And since the first lockdown, I haven't been back to the cinema. So I've been sort of on a Blu-ray kick. And recently that's kind of narrowed down to the golden age of Hollywood. Uh, and I started out with Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett, who was his collaborator. And from them, I kind of got on to Ernst Lubitsch and Eric von Stroheim and Joseph von Sternberg. And so I've not only been watching movies by these guys, which, which are great, and I recommend them most highly, but also I've been reading biographies. So the latest one I'm reading is How Did Lubitsch Do It? by uh, Joseph McBride. Who's, I've read his book on John Ford. He's like, he's a good writer about film and film directors. So that's currently what I'm reading. Uh, I've, I've also got a very good book. I'm looking at my coffee table, uh, a biography of Billy Wilder by Kevin Lally called Wilder Times. And, <laughs> I love uh, that title. <laughs> yeah, and they all overlap because Lubitsch was a hero of Wilder's. So I, I've been doing a lot of reading sort of uh, in support of my movie addiction. Well, as promised, we are here to discuss low action, which, oh my gosh, we can't get too much into it in the non-spoiler section, but talk about a book that keeps you gripped through till the very last page. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Oh my gosh. But before we jump into the book itself, there are some very fuzzy, uh, I would call them main characters, certainly some of my favorites of Turk and, oh dear. <laughs> Fanny. Fanny, thank you, <laughs> who are the main character's cats. And, of course, you also have a cat. How is she? Yeah, J Jade is absolutely great. She is, she's Turk in the book. She's got jade green eyes the same way that Turk's got turquoise blue eyes. I, I, you know, I didn't look miles and miles and miles for that. <laughs> and I did have a cat called Molly, who was her sister, who got run over, which was a terrible mm -hmm. tragedy. But she lives, lives on in the books in the form of Fanny. I mean, 
the connection there, I was sort of thinking, how can I get a, a name that sort of resonates? And I thought, well, I think of Moll Flanders, who was a sort of saucy heroine of, uh, I guess it would be 18th century literature. And I thought, oh, Fanny Hill was another one. So that's that's where that name, in case anybody wonders where that name came from. That's just sort of the free association that led to that. I love that, though. Well, I, I remember when my cat Molly died and my I said to my editor, should the should her equivalent in the book start? She said, no, for God's sake. Absolutely said, not. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, if she doesn't have to, why should she? You know, it's, at least I can control the little universe of my book. So I'm delighted to say that she lives on with her traits preserved, <laughs> <laughs> especially in the new book, the one, the book that you guys haven't read yet. There's, it, Fanny has some very good material. Ooh, I'm excited. And I'm grateful that I can go into these books knowing you won't do that to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's enough. Uh, these books are, uh, for anybody who doesn't know them, are the sort of cozy crime. My definition of cozy crime is basically that all kinds of horrible things can happen, but there's a sort of central core of stability and safety. I mean, our heroes are constantly in jeopardy, but I, I, I think you should know that I would never knowingly hurt the cats. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we actually have a point about that because there is, and I don't want to get into details because it's a little bit of a spoiler, but there there is a scene in this book where a kitten is being kind of horribly That's threatened. True. That 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 was really horrible. Man. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And and I was on the one hand, I was quite horrified because kitten violence. But on the other hand, I felt like I could probably trust that you weren't actually going to allow anything to happen I, to the kitten. I'm kind of surprised in a way that I did that, but I know what the thinking was. I was thinking, how could I force our heroes to do something that they don't want to do? And the answer was by threatening the kitten. Mm -hmm. And it was psychologically true. And like afterwards, they actually have a discussion about it. They're like, um, you know, if anybody does that again, what are we going to do? Like, you know, we can't mm -hmm. have this vulnerability. So, but yeah, I mean, that was that was horrible, but I hope that I made up for it. Most definitely. <laughs> yeah. It was very cruel, though, yeah. But uh, on the other hand, horrible things happen to people in these books all the time. We're, we're not as bothered about that. <laughs> Which, but I can understand that because humans are in a much greater sense responsible for their own destiny in the human world than, than, than animals ever can be. Mm -hmm. And they also can protect themselves in a way that, you know, a, a vulnerable kitten can't. Yeah. I, the, 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 I suppose another aspect of why that happened was just to show how really horrible. I have really had it in for the villains of this book. <laughs> and I think that shows like I, the real hatred for them, so, <laughs> which is not a bad thing in literature. You know, if you're going to have a bad guy, they should be intensely bad, I think. Oh, it was such excellent shorthand for us to know exactly who we should be rooting for in that situation. <laughs> Obviously yes. the main characters, but you always know the person threatening a kitten is the bad guy. <laughs> the fact that we're having this discussion, I guess, the good thing about it is it suggests that it was an effective sequence. Yes, it was quite chilling. A, quite effective. <laughs> Actually, the, the villain in general was absolutely horrifying, but we should talk about that after the spoiler break and stop okay. teasing people. <laughs> yes. So one thing that you've alluded to is that there's quite a lot of food in this book. And so very low stakes question. You have a recipe on page 292 where the vinyl detective is cooking pasta, I believe. And you, you kind of give the steps for this recipe. Let me see if I can actually find it in my copy of the book. And it sounds really good and I want to make it, but there's one thing that you don't clarify okay. and that's um, you, you add sliced mushrooms, but are the mushrooms supposed to be cooked or are they no, raw? No, no. Okay. No, okay. okay. They would be what we'd call chestnut mushrooms or larger mushrooms, not, not the really tiny little ones. Okay. Yeah. I just, I had that question because I want to make this no, recipe. No, good point. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, is this the, the lemon pasta? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, it's so easy and it's so good. It really is. I mean, one of the reasons why it appealed to me was because it sounded quite simple, but also very tasty. It's really tasty. And you do need to cook what we call in England fine beans. But I know from my, talking to my brother in Canada, nobody knows what they're, they're like, really skinny green be beans. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. <laughs> I, I steam them till they're al dente, like just slightly cooked. But Again, I was serving lunch to the actors the other day, and some people really don't like undercooked beans. So cook them to whatever consistency works for you. <laughs> Definitely going to have to try this. They're going to end up all lovely lemony and basil-y and parmesan-y 
and olive oily anyway. So it's, it, you know, it'll be fine. But mm -hmm. if you can get the bucatini, I think that's the word, which is looks like fat spaghetti, but it's actually they're hollow like straws. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has the edge on spaghetti. Although this recipe was originally conceived for spaghetti, I, I recommend a good bucatini if you can get it. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> I hope We're going to have to for that kind of pasta. <laughs> We're going to have to start a vinyl detective cookbook. I mean, I would, I would love one. <laughs> Thank you. Other people suggested that, and I am sort of thinking. Well, if I had enough recipes, I think that that would be a very good idea. You'd probably have to pad it out with cat photos and stuff. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I'd be disappointed if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, illustrations or uh, and lore about books. I know in the first book you mentioned a um, tomato sauce recipe that I actually got from you and make, which is just fantastic. Oh, and it's so easy. But the, the great thing, the great thing about that is, is you bake, you basically bake the sauce, and it has such a fantastic flavor. Yeah, I was making it uh, with tomatoes from my garden this summer, oh, which was a delight. You were so lucky. Like I'm so jealous of that. Well, as listeners may have noticed, the Vinyl Detective series is about the Vinyl Detective. <laughs> but this is one of those series of books where the main character does not have a name. And I was wondering if you call him something in your head or if it is just the Vinyl Detective. I, 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 I'm never really called upon to do that because whenever I think about him, mm -hmm. I think about everything from his point of view. I'm straight into his head. Mm -hmm. So I guess if I thought about him, I'd probably think about him as me. Because I'd be going going through the book in the first person viewpoint, not to say that he's Andrew Cartmel, but just if I was going to think about him, that's the way he would he'd be thinking about himself. Um, in conversation with other people, I tend to call him the detective, mm -hmm. or maybe mm -hmm. the vinyl detective. He was nicknamed Chef in the first book, which may prove useful later on, especially if Re ever recur the character who called him that ever recurs, which I, I hope she will at some point soon. <laughs> How many do you have a particular number of vinyl detective books that you want to write, or is it just as many no, as I want to keep writing them as long as they're good, as mm -hmm. long as I'm enjoying them and the readers are enjoying them? I want to keep writing them. And people have written over too easily. Uh, there are some of my favorite series are over 20 books, so it's totally doable. So, yeah, mm -hmm. keep going. In case everybody's interested, the, the series I was alluding to is the Travis McGee series written by John D. McDonald, which were brilliant. I was just, I'm going to give a quick plug for him. He's no longer with us, so he can't promote his own books. But there's some of the finest suspense, uh, crime, mystery, action novels ever written. And I was literally just thinking about one yesterday. It's called, all the books in the series are named after colors. And there's one called The Green Ripper. And it's it's one of the best books in the series. I'm not sure I'd recommend it as the first one because it there's a sort of cumulative power to it. So it's good to read a few others first. But the reason it's called The Great Green Ripper, such a great title. I mean, it's a great title in and of itself. But it's the phrase comes from a child who overheard his parents talking about the Grim Reaper and misheard it. So isn't that a great title? It's just I love the that. Title. Yeah. So folks, do check out the uh, the Travis McGee books. I would start with maybe The Turquoise Lament. That's a terrific one. So that, that might be a good one to start with. Going on the TBR. <laughs> uh, not that my to-be-read list needs to be any longer. Oh, no, <laughs> I, I know what that's like. I've got stacks and stacks of books. And the one thing about the pandemic is that because it's curtailed my traveling, both abroad, but also even within Britain, and I'm not even like, I used to, as I say, go to the movies, uh, go into to London and do the West End all the time. So I spent, I'd spent hours every week just traveling on public transport. And I, that was when I did my reading. So my reading has been sharply curtailed. I do set aside time and do read, but I, as I, I sort of indicated, I'm reading plays and nonfiction more than novels just at the moment. Those are still delightful, though. Still reading, still counts. <laughs> but I did do a binge of one particular novel, which we will get to, because I know there's a question coming up which he's relevant to. So I'll leave that novelist for the time being. A teaser. Okay. So drop that foreshadowing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that we've noticed over the course of this podcast is how the summaries on the backs of books are not always the same quality, shall we say, or just accuracy. But the description on the back of this one, I thought, really did capture sort of what the book is about and also the feel of it. And I was wondering if you had any say in that or if it's completely out of your control. I usually try and write them myself, but uh, but they can end up like a compromise between me and the publisher. I'm sure that they wouldn't do anything I was wildly opposed to. 
what also happens is that they'll take a, a, a crack at it and I kind of polish that, fix mm-hmm. it up. But I, uh, for instance, to go back to John D. MacDonald, I'm sure that he wrote his cover blurbs because they're so they're so kind of witty and from the world of the books. So I, I think that I think a lot of writers do write their cover blurb, which makes sense because that nobody understands the books better than they do. Which is so baffling when you get one that's just factually wrong. I have to imagine some publisher went rogue in those points. <laughs> oh, look, there's um, pub- publishers can do very strange things. <laughs> Uh, another question more about the making of the actual book than the writing of it is, I noticed when reading this that there are a couple of Britishisms. The one that stood out the most for me was the use of curb. And I was wondering, do your books get a once over for like Britishisms when they come to the US or or do they just get... So I think when you say curb, you guys use the same word, but spelled differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think we... Those are always spelled K-E-R-B. So here's the thing. When I'm writing the books, I grew up in Canada, but I've lived in England for a long time. And so I've got a sort of mid-Atlantic sensibility. So I will use certain words which are North American origin and sometimes use words of British origin. Just whatever I think would come naturally to me is you know, what mm-hmm. I would actually say. For instance, I would never say trainers, which is the British word for running shoes, because it just to suggest to me like training bras or something like that. So I would always say, I'd say sneakers. And I, I, my characters would say sneakers too, but I think that that's perfectly fine because we do have quite a global culture now with America kind of in, in the, the catbird scene. <laughs> but more specifically to the answer to your question, my books are published in, in North America and in Britain by the same publisher, Titan, and they use the same plates it's the same book in both mm-hmm. countries so they adopt certain american conventions because they use the, the quotation marks or double quote marks that like you guys use in the states whereas in england they'd use single quote marks which they call inverted commas which is a stupid name but that's what they call <laughs> so they they do adopt quite a lot of conventions to be in accord with the american marketplace and there it's titan who have the final decision about spelling words like curb and, and it, it, it's clearly they've gone for that one neither of which would i mean it wouldn't bother me if spelt c-u-r-b but they they clearly have sort of made a a, a judgment call about when mm-hmm. they're going to have britishisms and when they're going to have americanism i hope they're not jarring but no I, no no not not jarring at all especially because as you say like you live in the uk it makes sense that you <laughs> that you would use uh britishisms and the book is set there <laughs> and, the, and the book is set there yeah it's just that something that I, as an American reader, noticed. Yeah, I, I, my friend Ben Aronich, who writes the Rivers of London novels, he had a lot of problems with his books because they're they're more intensely idiomatically British than mine are. Mm-hmm. And his American publisher started fixing that, like changing pavement to sidewalk. Mm-hmm. And it, the thing is, it's the book rapidly starts to lose its savour and its individuality if you do that. Because there aren't equivalents. Like he would talk about his characters having a kip, which means to sleep. Mm-hmm. And, and his um, publisher wanted to change it to having a nap. But it's not the same thing because a nap is a particular kind of sleep and kip is just sleep. And uh, Ben made, very tellingly made the point. He said when he was reading, growing up reading 87th Precinct novels, I mean, if he didn't wasn't familiar with something, he would understand it from context anyway and he would all could always look it up and these days is there's it's so much easier to look something up i i don't think there's really any issue about things like that i think people will get a get it from from the context in the book and b uh, look it up if they don't or if they want mm-hmm. to know more it always makes me go have i been spelling this wrong all of my life <laughs> it's funny because you know there's certain words like um to the English spelling, spelling of jail, which just is bananas. It's like G A O L. So I've never used that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just completely nuts to me. I didn't. I but, didn't actually realize that that was pronounced the same way as jail. No, it just looks like goal. Yeah, mis- <laughs> misprinted. But yeah, but other things I find jarring in the American spelling. So you know, it's because as I say, I sort of grew up halfway mm-hmm. between the two cultures, and it's sort of liminal space <laughs> between the two cultures gray i don't spell that with an a the american way it has to be with an e yeah but if you go back and read a dashiell hammett story from the 1920s or 30s a great american crime writer he was spelling it that way at the time and, and is what is also fascinating is in the 20s and 30s and it, even later they would talk about my flat meaning my apartment and that's definitely these days if you talk about a flat 
it would be a British person saying that, not an mm-hmm. American. But there was a time when that was standard for Americans too. And um, just to, on Dashiell Hammett again, uh, I remember reading like when they talk about cars in the 1920s, they called them the machine. And that, I, I was watching a, a silent movie the other day, and the guy was saying, "Oh, we'll be riding in the machine," and they just used to call them machine, which it seems so strange to us now. But they just say, "Oh, I left the machine parked outside," and people, everybody would understand it was the car. So that sort of thing is great if you were writing a period novel. I mean, that's the sort of detail that adds so much flavor and authenticity to it. I just just love that. And I was listening to a documentary on the radio about uh, Victorian children, and one of them was talking about going home late down a dark alley. And she said, oh, we would sing so we wouldn't get the jumps. I thought, the jumps? Like, what a great piece of idiom. So I, those things to me are all to be treasured, all those little idiosyncrasies, which are so useful for conjuring atmosphere and conjuring a sense of period and place. Definitely. It's, I think it's really fascinating how language evolves and how including that in a book, like you say, can, can just add to the atmosphere and the sense of authenticity. It just takes just one or two sentences out of somebody's mouth to convince you like that they're, I don't know, a pathologist or a medical expert or, or, you know, like an expert on, on insects. Just a bit of kind of really fluid, flowing, not jargon, but just just saying something that's replete with knowledge and, and like comes across with authority. And you, as I say, you don't even need to understand what they're talking about necessarily. To, to really think, okay, I'm, you completely convinced me that this character is what you're saying they are. And you've done a little bit of research and you don't need much. Research is like a, a really powerful spice. You don't you use a little pinch of it here and there. Too much will, will just overwhelm your, your recipe. Changing gears a little bit, there is a famous quote, although I perhaps disagree with it a little bit, <laughs> by George R. R. Martin, who claims that he writes good female characters because he sees them as people. Uh, your female characters, I am very impressed by. <laughs> well, thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you. I mean, this book has so many, partially because it is focused on an all-girl band, but also we have Nevada and Agatha and Penny, Nevada's mother. We were wondering if there were any people in your life that inspired these characters, or if you are just that great at conjuring up entire human beings. <laughs> well. I mentioned earlier a novelist who I really revere called Brian Moore. And he was uh, born in Belfast, moved to Canada, and then eventually ended up in California. And he wrote, I suppose, about 21, 22 novels in his lifetime. And they're what we'd call mostly what we call mainstream novels, not really any show. There are a couple of thrillers in there, which are very good. And uh, even a kind of ghost story in a way. But he's a brilliant novelist and the thing is the strength of his female character they're, they're amazing like he's he was really highly regarded and he because he was a hero of mine i, I suppose that that must have had an effect in in some way i was interviewed about i was talking about him in an interview a year or so ago and i didn't realize that as a result that what this is set in motion but it was brian moore's centenary and out of the blue, my agent got an email saying that I'd like to take place in an online discussion of, of his literary works with this this festival that's taking place in Belfast. And I thought, how the hell did they get hold of it? They must have read this interview where I, where I was singing his praises. And I, I went joined a discussion about Brian Moore's women. I, I think one reason, if, if I am writing good female characters, and thank you for saying that, uh, it would be because this guy's one of my heroes. But I was thinking about this today, too. I am such an admirer of Janelle Monet and Joni Mitchell, and I don't see how anybody could revere artists like that and then sit down and create a woman who wasn't kind of three-dimensional and interesting, just because you have these examples. I mean, Joni Mitchell's such an amazing woman, such a multi-talented, deep, fascinating character. So I think that's, that's part of it, too. I wouldn't say that there's any particular characters people, real people in my life that, that they're particularly based on or who have inspired me. It's it's more to do with other artists who have written well about women and other artists who are women uh, who have sort of lit that spark in my imagination. On a kind of related note, this is something that I especially have started noticing after reading very gendered stories like Sphere, where I was very... So this is a Michael Crichton novel. It's a lot of Michael, the sea stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I was very particularly struck there by how 
when he was introducing his male characters, how different that was from his introductions of the female characters. And so something that I really appreciated about your books and, and low action was that you're very even handed in your introduction. Like it feels like you're just introducing people and you're introducing people in the same way. So give me a flavor. Is it to do with how he describes them physically or is it, what is it? Yeah, it's yeah. it's so when he introduces the male characters, he doesn't focus on their physicality. And when he introduces the female characters, it's all about how they look. Lots of talk about hips. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So more about their, 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 their bodies rather than what they're wearing. Because I could understand the female characters having more interesting clothing, which demands a better description. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, yeah, I, I that's a good point because I was inspired to try and write women well by people who did write women well, but also by people who wrote women really <laughs> badly because you don't want to be that guy. And also just women, this is not so much to do with prose, but like I, I used to work on a TV show called Doctor Who and I watched a lot of early Doctor Who's where the women would literally like the, they'd be fighting the Dalek invasion of Earth and the women would be making the tea. It was like <laughs> it was like on that level. And you know, we were so much past that. Actually, when I was working on Doctor Who, years later somebody said that you and Doctor Who stories were the only ones that ever passed the Bechtel test. And so I didn't even know what we were doing. I just knew that we were trying to make our, all of our characters interesting, including the women. <laughs> yeah, early Doctor Who was not great for that. I love it, but it was not great for that. Yeah, but you see, that's unforgivable because right at that same time, they were making the Avengers with um, mm -hmm. Warner Blackman or Diana Rigg, who were really great kick-ass characters who took no prisoners and were, you know, they were played by superb actresses, but the, the writing played to those characters. And they, like... Uh, so Emma Peel and Kathy Blake, I'm trying to remember the other character's name, Kathy Gale, I think, they never made anybody a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> or if they did, it was like, you know, on the basis of still being a complete kick-ass female who just happened to be very good at making tea. It was, yeah, so I think that we shouldn't let Doctor Who off the hook if in 1963 other television programs were featuring fantastic women. Yeah, most most definitely. That was one of the other things I noticed in this book, how every character has their own strengths and I, none of them are judged for being, you know, I don't know, women's work or anything. The vinyl detective is the chef and Nevada, his partner, has other strengths and, you know, an interest in fashion, which could be dismissed as lady stuff, but is very evenly praised in the story. Oh, but she monetizes it because she's into it the same way he's into, into the, uh, the the vinyl, which is interesting. And she has expertise in wines. He has expertise in food. And the great thing that I lucked into is you sort of, there's a whole school of crime and thriller fiction where the hero is like, you know, he's a karate expert and he works out and he, he's, you know, that guy, I suppose we're talking about sort of Jack Reacher kind of characters, but I'm much more interested in the character who, if he gets into trouble, you're going to be scared on his behalf because he's not that guy. He's just an average guy. But it is also useful to have an action hero. And I worked out this thing that his girlfriend can be the action hero. She can be the one with all that knowledge. And like she can keep do the kick-ass stuff. And it was great because it left my hero down to earth and mundane and vulnerable. But we could still do the action hero stuff. And at the same time, it was an empowerment of women thing. So it was just, it just solved lots of. Uh, storytelling problems while at the same time not being a tired or offensive cliche. I just really, really loved it when I realized that. I thought that's great. It was a way of having my cake and eating it too. Absolutely. And Nevada is so good. I, I Whenever I, I haven't done a signing for a while now for reasons that'll be obvious to you, but what I always ask when people come up to me is who's your favorite character? And Nevada is the winner, but Tinkler, surprisingly, I think comes in at number two. Interesting. I, I like Tinkler, but I'm not sure I would have called him my favorite character. No, no, absolutely not. I, I, I would have thought, you know, maybe Agatha, um, the, the cat, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> but yeah, Tinkler would have been the last person I would have expected. During the last time we spoke, we asked you if you had to do any research for the jazz which the answer was obviously no. <laughs> but uh, in low action, there are a lot more varied music genres, specifically punk. And do you have the same baseline familiarity with that? Or did you have to do, like you said, sprinkle? Not really, although I did grow up when punk was a thing. So I sort of, I know that era fairly well. But what I, I did do research, I didn't listen to the music because I wouldn't have liked it and my hero wouldn't have liked it. But I did do research on the period and the 
the bands and the musical movement and how it came about. And that was really valuable because a number of things came out of that. One was that there was genuinely an interview where the, the Sex Pistols were on television and they swore that like that they were cussing full on four letter words. Uh, and that was a huge scandal at the time. I thought, oh, I could do something like that. And that became pivotal in the book. And the other really crucial piece of information that came through was about the the punk DIY ethos and the way fanzines were a big thing. Like you'd do these little home cooked fanzines and they were a major part of the punk movement. I thought, oh, again, that's really useful to me in terms of character and, and a kind of background and plot. I absolutely loved that we got to see you know, the, the punk band all grown up and the sort of the different paths each member took in her life. That was just an absolutely fascinating just focus of the novel, I guess, the, the book. The book was good, is what well, that sentence you. turned it was into. A lot of fun doing that. And it's interesting, the characters, because one of them is like a really right-wing politician and a sort of person that I don't really like or have any time for in real life. But because it, this was a character in my book, I had to make her as real as possible. And she came out, she she ended up being really quite a sympathetic, well-rounded three-dimensional character instead of being mm-hmm. a punching bag. Uh, and she re- represents a lot of things that I just hate, but I was very pleased that she doesn't come across that way in the book. She comes across as a person. <laughs> yeah, uh, when you first introduced her in the story, I was like, I'm not going to like you. And then by the end, I was like, oh, I, I actually really do like you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's the trouble with, is that, or maybe the trouble is that we don't realize that these people who are political opposites, if we actually spend a weekend with them, we'd probably find that we've got a lot in common, I, which I think I think the only way forward is for us to find common ground. But it's so easy to forget that. And I'm certainly the first person to forget that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, switching gears a little bit to a question about how you actually plan out your your murder mysteries. Even from the beginning, it seems like you work in a lot of possibilities and do you specifically create these characters to be red herrings or is that just a function of the story and how it evolves? Uh, yeah, well, yes, 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 yes. And all, but also not exactly the way we, we, you suggest. So again, to go back to John D. McDonald and the Travis McGee books, he said this fantastic thing. Somebody said to him, oh, you've written 21 Travis McGee thrillers. He said, no. He said, I wrote seven of them are thrillers. Five of them are mysteries. One of them's a horror novel. And like, I thought, wow, like there's the one's a suspense novel and one's a whodunit. And so, yeah, you can have, under the general umbrella of your crime fiction, you can have all these different genres. And although I don't necessarily think about the specific genre or subgenre of the book, I do kind of often think, for instance, the book Victory Disc was very much written when I was highly influenced, or not, not even highly, I was just really loving the work of a writer called Colonel Woolrich, who also wrote under the name William Irish. He's a very famous American suspense writer, best known now through Hitchcock's film of Rear Window, which is based on one of his stories. And in fact, I've just ordered the Blu-ray of Phantom Lady, which is another classic film noir based on a a Colonel Woolrich story. Really impressive and memorable characteristic of Woolrich, but which aren't always brilliantly written or don't always have very necessarily three-dimensional characters, is the suspense is off the charts like he has characters who are buried alive the most horrible things happen to his characters and like you're just in a sweat and actually that comes from all the way from edgar Allan poe i mean it's like the burial alive motif is something that's in in poe very much as well as in colonel woolrich and so when i wrote victory disc there's two sequences i don't want to provide any spoilers at just at this point but there are two sequences which are absolutely written thinking I'm going to do a Colonel Woolrich. I want to write a, a story, you know, a, this part of the story. I want it to have that absolutely macabre and relentless suspense where it's just a nightmare. A nightmarish, mm-hmm. yeah. So in the case of the book in hand, low action, I thought I'm going to write an Agatha Christie, something out, out of my love of writing Agatha Christie. And you, Agatha Christie writes different kind of books, but specifically the kind of really sort of classic straight down the middle who done it where she sets and she doesn't always do this she, she writes different kinds of books she's a very interesting writer but the one where she sets up a whole bunch of suspects right mm-hmm. and so the story is you've got a bunch of suspects uh, what you actually have is a bunch of characters all of whom are suspects and all of whom are equally plausible as the killer right <laughs> and i had a discussion with a, a chap a few weeks ago he was actually a guy i'd met because he'd sent me a doctor who script decades ago 
and he got back in touch because he wanted to ask me some questions about radio. I thought, of course I will. And it, he, it turns out he was a Agatha Christie nut and he'd read Low Action and he said, it reminded me of Peril at End House. And I thought, jackpot, you know, <laughs> give that man a, a gold star because that was the book that I, I use as my exemplar, Peril at End House, because there's no resemblance between that novel and Low Action at all, except that it's... And this is why it was so clever of him, so perceptive of him to see it. It sets up all these characters very evenly, and any of them could be the bad guy. And it's so I was really impressed with that, with his um, shrewdness at seeing that. But yeah, so this is absolutely one of those novels where it's based on there's a wide range of characters. They're, they all look like they could have done it, and it's hard to guess. <laughs> but to get back to Sarah's question about the red herrings, I want to go into this a bit more in the spoiler section. But I've taken now to literally putting red herrings in my books. <laughs> so, I, I, and like well, to explain what I mean by literally red herrings, I think we better reserve that for the spoiler section. But I'm having a lot of fun with that now. Well, I'll say Sarah and I both were so sure that a specific character was the bad guy, but they were different ones and we yeah. were both wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so you had, you're just the same one, but it was it was the wrong one. Is that right? We each had different ones, but oh, we were each positive that we were right. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes people do, and sometimes people do guess the bad guy, but my friend Ben says, there'll always be, some, don't worry, it's like, a, it's like a bell curve. Some, or some people will always be able to guess just through sheer luck, if nothing else, mm-hmm. who's going to be, who done it. But most people won't. So that's just great. I mean, it's, and it's really gratifying. Again, thank you for that. You're making my making my day, guys. Well, I assume that's why you come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Where are you going, massage? <laughs> so unfortunately, the only other book of yours that I've read was Written in Dead Wax, which is the first book in this series. Although I, I do plan on rectifying that. Oh, in the well, thank you. I'm glad you told me that because then I will, won't, to give any spoilers except for books you've read when we get to the spoiler section. Thank you. <laughs> so as my reference for your writing, in Written in Dead Wax, the vinyl detective is looking for an album, a specific album that is not necessarily connected with the mystery that he ends up solving. Whereas in it's, this book... It's, it's, it's sort of, forgive me for interrupting, mm-hmm. but it's the MacGuffin in the same sense that in, in Dash Land, it's the Maltese Falcon. There's a statue, I think, jewel-encrusted statue out of a falcon called the Maltese Falcon, which everybody's after. In that book, Wooden and Dead Wax, everybody's after a very valuable record. So that's that's the function it plays. But you're right, it doesn't sort of... Well, it is sort of... Inter- because once she starts looking for it, the characters who are involved with it do become important. But it, as you say, in this book, it's the other way around, because we've got the characters who made the record from the start. And it, that's just such a different... I guess the 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 content of the album itself is so much more connected with the mystery. And I was wondering if that affected the the storytelling process at all, or if that's just a quirk of a varied and interesting series. So do you mean in the first book, the, the, the content of the album is much more? I mean, in low action, because the content is sort of the more the point. Yeah. Uh, the thing, a word of advice to writers who are listening, never never read your reviews, but you kind of sort of sometimes do have to read your re- reviews because you're, you're looking for quotes to pull out. And I read this review by this guy who's like, um, I think it was the third or fourth book, and he just, he bailed. He didn't even finish the book. He said, it's just the same. Every time they're just looking for a record, I've had enough of this. It's just so repetitive. Oh. I was I was seething with, I still am now, as you can see, like years <laughs> later. But, but that, I really tried really hard to ring the changes. I don't want anybody to think that it's the same pattern every time. So even though they're looking for a record this time, they're really only looking for a record as a way of getting our hero on board, because that's what he does, because they want his skills basically to flush out a killer. Is that Would that be a fair kind of summary of the book? Yeah. <laughs> so although the, the vinyl detective's thing is that he does look for rare records, I make it as different as possible. In every, and it's, he's not going to look for a rare record in every book. There'll be other things that will happen, but they, they all have to be things that would happen naturally in the world he inhabits. And I mean, I, personally, I think you're very successful. Like I've enjoyed all of the books, all of the vinyl detective books, and I don't think that they're repetitive or anything like that. I, don't so. think, I think it was such unfair criticism. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of my rather glaring gap in the series as far as knowledge goes, I asked Sarah, and she said that the character Bong Cha is introduced in an earlier novel, but we just sort of get hints and glimpses of her. 
So of course, now I have to go back and read that one because I have so many questions. But I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Like she was still introduced. She, she turns up in book two, which is The Run Out Groove. And I'm going to invoke, because I'm a comic book nut, I'm going to invoke a great American comic strip called Terry and the Pirates, which is basically about a, a kid who is over in China in the 20s and 30s, and he got caught up with pirates. Initially, it was a story about pirates. But the, the reason I bring that up is that these great characters would occasionally occur in the comic strip. And instead of just always moving on, Milton Caniff, who created Terry and the Pirates, he began to keep the characters and bring them back in. So he, he had this increasing ever-growing repertory company of fascinating characters. And people began to love that about the strip because they think, oh, when's the dragon lady coming back? You know, things like that. And so in Europe, we have a strip called Tintin. And it's the same thing with that. Like we have Captain Haddock, we have Professor Calculus, we have the Thompson twins, none of which will mean anything to you unless you're a Tintin fan. (laughs) But I've always loved that thing where you create this rich group of characters and you don't just dump them and you don't just wipe the slate clean every time. For a start, it's so much more fun. It's so much easier for the writer if you've got a character who's already created, who already is part of that world. And it's more fun for the readers too if they, they've read it before. So that's one of one of the great joys of these books is that I've got quite a rogues gallery of characters and it's terrific to bring them back, to use them judiciously in the stories where they will really add something to it. And of course I have Stinky Stanmer, who's just there for everybody to hate, including me. <laughs> it's, it's almost like a ritual that he comes on and he just he sort of comes on, does his thing and he goes away again. And it, but it's a, a perfect kind of like little ingredient in, in, in the whole meal. Not the whole meal, but the entire meal. <laughs> I have to say, despite having missed her actual introductory novel, I didn't feel like I was out of the loop when she was on the page. So how do you make sure that you still give the characters enough context for readers like me who skip around? I think in that, in low action, I just had some of the characters talking about it because she's sort of the, um, she's sort of the housekeeper for this narcissistic rock star called Eric Maycloud. And what had actually happened was some of my readers I thought that they were having an affair. I thought, no, 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 because that's so not true. <laughs> so I had a couple of my characters speculating about whether they're having an affair. And so I could lay that ghost to, to rest. <laughs> for a start, Bong Chow would never have an affair with Eric. Like she, she's so far beneath her, it's not funny. She has better taste than that. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. And she's seen like the string of harlots who've passed through his life. You know, the cardboard cutout sort of groupies that he's, he's dealt with all, all that time. So, but it's... They're such fun to have because also, although she theoretically works for him, she's kind of in charge. You know? <laughs> so I love that power dynamic. And uh, I guess I can see their relationship quite clearly, but it's evolved because like he used he used to just be like a serial monogamist sleeping with all these young women who, because of his rock star position. But in this book, he's actually fallen in love and got a live-in girlfriend which has changed that, and who Bong Cha quite likes. She, she likes the stabilizing influence on him. <laughs> so although these characters do have their traits and their place and their, their kind of setups, they do evolve and change and grow, which is fun too. Absolutely. Well, other than all of the wonderful information we've already gone over, Sarah, why should you read this book? If you enjoy punk, if you like um, Agatha Christie, if you like mysteries and vinyl and really wonderful, well-rounded characters, I think you should definitely pick up this book. It doesn't hurt if you like cats, too. Yes, yes. if you like cats, <laughs> if you want to be hungry while you're reading and really want some wine, <laughs> this is a good book for that, too. I do love good food and wine, and that that I've given those traits to two of my characters. Nevada is a wine expert, and our hero, the detective, is a foodie, and she, he appreciates her expertise, and, and she his. They've got a nice relationship. Oh, that's another thing that people say to me, that they really like that relationship because it kind of gives you hope. You know? Yeah, I, I love the relationship and how it's evolved over the course of the series and how they, they very clearly care for each other and support each other. And I think that's really nice to read, especially in times like these where you want something comforting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I've got to say, actually, I was getting goosebumps when you were saying that because I'm so proud that, that, that they come across that way. But you must read the next book because it's really it's really good about that aspect of things. And again, this is back to cozy crime because we've got this, I don't want to say it's a loving relationship, although it is, but that sounds like it's all kind of um, little Tweety birds. We've got this strong, believable relationship 
for these people who care for each other and they got cats so you've got this <laughs> lovely kind of domestic cuddly domesticity in the center of some of the most horrifying atrocities so that's it's, the balance is very useful and very good i think mm -hmm. absolutely I have more questions about the relationships in this book, but those are all purely spoilers, so <laughs> let's move on to that section. <laughs> to avoid spoilers for low action, skip to 1.11.16. Uh, so you mentioned in our previous conversation that you were putting actual red herrings <laughs> <laughs> into the book. Yes. And I always find a different way of doing it in every book. But in this book, one of the characters' names is actually an anagram of red herring. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought people would just jump on this on it right away. But yeah, Darren Gear. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Wait. <laughs> That's evil. <laughs> Yeah, I love so, it. I love it. That's wonderful. And the, the other, and they, they won't always be anagrams, but the, as long as I can keep coming up with ways of putting them in, there'll be things like anagrams. So in that this particular book, yeah. But I, the thing was, I, he wasn't quite enough of a red herring because there's this difficult balancing act because there's a character who might be the bad guy, and he's disappeared to India, and that that's the the um, he's the husband of the school mistress, uh, the headmistress who committed suicide. So he'd have a reason mm -hmm. for revenge. And he's said to have gone to India. And Darren Gere met his wife, who's one of the one of the blue tits, in front of the Taj Mahal. And that's where, and I thought people put two and two together and think he's the guy from India. But it was too subtle. But the thing is, if I said, oh, you know, we met in India, I thought that would be too much. You say, it's just, <laughs> you know, a good red herring isn't too obvious. This one was perhaps not obvious enough. But anyway, so, so he was my total red herring in this particular book. But there's loads of other red herrings, obviously. I was convinced it was Monica. <laughs> I thought it was going to be Fanzine Frank. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you were close, weren't you? <laughs> I, was, I was close. <laughs> When did you start putting actual red herrings in your book? Is is this something that we can find from the very beginning or? There is one in this book. There was one in the previous book, which is flipped back. And there's one in the next book. So it hadn't occurred to me that, that I could actually do that until until I got to flip back. And then I did, uh, did play this little game, which once uh, Lily has read flip back, we'll talk about <laughs> We started talking about some of the relationships between the characters in this book, uh, focusing to begin with on the two sort of main romances between the detective and Nevada and also Eric and Hel Helen? Helene? Helene, I would say. Helene, that, you know, okay. However you can answer that, it's fine. With me. <laughs> they both have different relationships, but still extremely, I'm going to use the word wholesome, but as far as their, you know, their love and devotion to each other is extremely heartwarming. So what what was it like building these sort of different dynamics for these relationships? Well, uh, heartwarming is a nice, nice thing to say about Helene and, and Eric. <laughs> they, they do get together every Friday and take cocaine, <laughs> I would point out. Yeah, and, 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 other, and a host of other drugs, because they are those kind of rock and roll people. Mm -hmm. And our, our hero, uh, and Nevada aren't really like that. Nevada is kind of into that, but our hero is very, very straight arrow kind of Boy Scout where drugs are concerned, which makes for an interesting tension between the two. Or rather, not not a tension as such, but an interesting gradient of difference between the two of them. One reason that I love the relationship between Nevada and our hero is because in the first book, he starts off. There are two kinds of detectives: there's the lone wolf detective. Which is the prevalent kind, or there's the kind that we have a detective duo, like a husband and wife detective team duo, like Macmillan and Wife. And there, there's another famous uh, TV series, but I, I can't, I've forgotten, blanked on the name for a minute. But yeah, so I was writing the Written in Dead Wax, the first book. I had this revelation that he could start out as a lone wolf, because the classic thing is the lone wolf detective is just sitting alone in his office, then the femme fatale arrives, and the woman of mystery arrives. And at the end of the book, she's she's either the bad guy or she's dead or she moves on but in this case she stayed and moved in and we've got a detective couple so i love the fact that we could do that and also it was much more it's much more fun writing about people who are in like a genuine real relationship than these there's a lot of these kind of alcoholic tormented loner type detectives like harry hola or uh, inspector rebus i mean there's no end of them right <laughs> so i'm i think it's much 
this is it's different and it's also more fun to write about and it's also congenial and um very suitable for a cozy crime book absolutely and i i would like to clarify i wouldn't call helene and eric themselves heartwarming but they're clearly so good for each other or right for each other and that's it, it what's nice. because, um, <laughs> he was he was a lost cause mm-hmm. and he's she's completely changed him and it's it's so it is heartwarming in that regard because he's he's a reformed character in in mm-hmm. certain regards and it also it shows a there's suddenly a depth of feeling because he's really worried that she might end up there because this book, uh, spoiler, this has been the spoiler section, is a, not about a murder. It's about a murder that they don't want to have. It's about preventing a murder. So again, that, that sort of rings the changes a bit. We also get the relationships between the band members of the, the Blue Tits and how they go through such dynamic change. Right at the beginning, there's much more tension, to put it lightly. But then at the end, you know, they're reunited and it's really lovely. Uh, I think maybe the moment that stood out to me the most was on page 371, which is not helpful at all. But that's the, that's the <laughs> scene where they're first reunited. Is it, oh, is it where they're walking back together after the gig or sorry to tell me what it is? No, that's the scene when Ophelia is going to storm out, but then Monica pukes and then faints or passes out. And <laughs> Helene and Ophelia put their differences aside to help this person who they don't necessarily like, but clearly <laughs> needs the hand. And that was just such a genuine moment of putting your animosity aside for the greater good. And it really builds a bridge between them. And it was such so nice. It's kind of an icebreaker. I might even say that in the book. It's a bit <laughs> of an icebreaker. It, yeah, because in those bands, I mean, bands, you always have friction and animosity and like, grudges and vendettas so that's fun to explore in a kind of and especially in a book where you're wondering who's going to kill who's the killer those mm-hmm. are those are gold dust but it's also nice to have a process of development because instead of it just being that situation that dynamic to have it change into something else to develop into something else is much more rewarding and interesting to for the reader to follow it's not just the same thing all the time Mm -hmm. And because we see this change sort of slowly throughout the course of the book, when they are at the end of the gig arm in arm, it feels like such a celebratory moment for the reader as well as for them, of course. Because we've actually come on a journey. Yeah, it's it's nice. I'm I'm basically an old softy, so I like heartwarming stuff. (laughs) Unrelated and not a question, not really a question, but the Goat's Aid shirts that you describe sound really awesome and I want one and I think you should have them as merchandise. I think that that, that will happen quicker than the um, final detective cookbook because I think it's a really good idea and it's quite easy. I just need somebody to do the design, which I see very clearly in my head of this stone cartoon goat smoking a joint with like spiral, you know, crazy spiral <laughs> eyes. <laughs> you just have to think of the sort of t-shirt that Tinkler would commission. Yeah. But I think <laughs> we should definitely do those. Please remind me, sir, and we will make that happen. Yeah, because I would I would love one. I'd wear it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it would like, be a great shirt. It would be like black and white and pink, I think, will be mm-hmm. the color. Okay, so so more related to uh, the content <laughs> of the book, but one of the things that I enjoyed was that we get more of Nevada's backstory in this. Um, like we meet her mother and we hear kind of about her journey from schoolgirl to now. Uh, was that something that you envisioned, that particular arc? Was that something that you envisioned for her from the beginning of writing the series? Or did that develop along with this particular book as you needed needed to, to have her be more of that action hero? I, I discovered it as I went along. It wasn't planned from the beginning, but I gradually began to think of what this character, how this character could have come about. And as you say, it was very useful in terms of this book for her to meet her mother. Mm -hmm. What I lucked into was the idea that the Blue Tits were this band that had come from the the, the posh girls' school where where Nevada had gone. And so it, it was a perfect time for us to go and meet her mother. And I needed to start deepening these characters and give them some kind of connections in the world. And because it's understandable why characters don't have families especially in thrillers because that's not what you're interested in you're interested in the exciting stuff but real people do have families and so as these characters go on for them to remain real to me and the readers I think we need to start deepening and broadening that and I was very pleased because the mother 
then enabled me to give what I rather reductively re refer to as Nevada's origin story. <laughs> so she was a kind of a superhero. <laughs> I'm still glad that you, you like that, Sarah, because when I put that in the book, I thought the fans are going to go nuts. That everybody was going to really be interested in knowing where Nevada came from. And I think you're about the, only the second person who's sort of shown any interest in it. Because I thought oh, people love Nevada, so they're going to really get down with the fact that we now know more about her. And I think they will gradually. I think people are sort of are interested, but people aren't shouting about it on social media as much as I would like. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved that glimpse at her past. I mean, I felt very sorry for her because it's not necessarily a happy past exactly, but I loved I loved getting it. And it I feel like it really helps you understand more about her as a person. Yeah. And also she has an unusually high aptitude for mayhem. And I thought, how could she actually be know all this stuff? And I thought, oh, because she she's not she isn't officially trained like she she isn't a special like a I'm trying to think special forces kind of person we call it the SAS in 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 Britain but if she if her lover her first great love was this guy who was that and she got the skills from him that works you know and it doesn't you know it's just so suddenly it's this wonderful explanation for all these skills she has for you know uh, spying and um, infiltration and, and uh, you know uh, counter-attacking bad guys so i was very very pleased to have come up with that and as you say it's sort of a tragic backstory because she couldn't she couldn't save this guy he's, he's a hopeless alcoholic who drinks himself to death but then a lot of those kind of guys who do that kind of macho special forces kind of and have been traumatized in battle are like that so it seemed to seem to ring true all, all the way through and one reason that I sort of did that in the way I did is because we'd already established that Nevada is really good at archery. This is again in the book, uh, the run out group, the second book. And I thought, well, you know, I don't want this ever to, to reach the point where it seems unbelievable. She has these skills. So I wanted to start explaining these skills. And I was doing, I, I had a table at a comic convention where I was selling my books. And then the people at the next stall were actually an archery that they, they were people selling like archery courses so i talked to these two women who ran this archery school and i got and that was a, that was a classic example of where you don't need a lot of uh terminology or information to make it sound convincing but i just got found out what kind of bow nevada would have used and she has a line in the book about this about her bow which is what's happened to my bow and, and she just refers to the kind of bow it is and, and stuff and it's just you don't go into too much detail but you really think oh okay so she knows about archery and she does because i spoke to these women who really really do know about archery and they gave me a lot of information i kind of boiled it down to just some tasty little morsels that were, which were really useful in the book I think I had two favorite moments in Nevada's background reveal. And this isn't a question at all. I'm just talking about the book. <laughs> but, uh, the way the detective reacts to it, just so like low key, not making about not making it about himself. Yes. It was just absolutely so refreshing, not getting all weird about a girlfriend who existed before him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was that was wonderful. Well, that's really nice to hear. Thank you. And that's unusual, is it? He said naively. <laughs> <laughs> There's also that wonderful sort of full cycle where we find out Nevada had started off as sort of the manager for a bodyguard. But then at the end, she herself is the bodyguard. And I just really sort of loved that journey for her. It fit really well. Yeah, the student becomes the master. It, it is kind of classic. But it also... Um, Nevada has always been this expert in languages, and this was my chance to, to make that plausible too. And mm -hmm. so when she and the guy were together, I've forgotten his name, but that's that's uh, when our hero, she, she's really worried that she's talking about how deeply she loved this guy. And it's what you were referring to about how he's going to react to her previous lover. And he makes some joke about the guy's name, how he could never feel insecure because <laughs> the guy's such a stupid name. <laughs> And it sort of, it sort of uh, lets the pressure out, out at that point. But yeah, when Nevada was with the guy, which she was the one who she had the business head and she could speak the languages. And he had the he had the skills that would enable him to be a bodyguard, like for the oligarchs in the south of France. And that's great because it's very true to her. And we should see now she's still up the, she's like our hero's business manager, too. And we, we see her using languages all the time. Which is great because although I don't speak any other languages, I've, I've got a little bit of Spanish and a tiny bit of French. I, whenever I, I, like in the next book, they go to Sweden 
And I, I, I learned a bit of Swedish, like some Swedish language and, and some fascinating aspects of how you say things in Swedish. Because Nevada would be totally, that's the thing that she's really into. And so it was fun for me to put a bit of that in there because I learned something and Nevada learned something. And it's very true to the character. And it's kind of, it's a nice little thing for the reader too, which also makes the, the locale, the location very real to them. And this will be your first, I mean, barring the first book, which had some of the action take place in California, this will be the first final detective book that is set outside of the UK, right? Yeah. And I guess Japan, there is some action in Japan in the Still first in book the first as well. Book. Yeah. Yeah. But, but so they've been, you're right, this will be the first time, and it, not the entire book, but uh, most of the book takes place in Sweden, which is great because, um, I mean, it's properly researched. I went there and I, I the Swedish part of the book is, if you remember Flipback, which Lily hasn't read, but in Flipback, they go to this island, which is mm -hmm. my own version of Lindisfarne, a real island, but it's it's an imaginary take on Lindisfarne, this island in the UK. And people who read that book love the island. Like, I invented this island. It's an imaginary place. But they just, <laughs> the people say, oh, I, I'd like to go to that island. So obviously lived in their imaginations. It came alive in their imaginations in a very satisfying way. And I hope and believe that my Swedish town will have the same effect. And the reason I believe it is because my buddy Ben reads my manuscripts before they're published. I read his. And he, he said that. He said he really loves the Swedish town. Like it really is. It, so it, I do really enjoy creating these locations. And I'm looking forward to when the world opens up a bit more. Like I want to go to, I want to send our heroes to Italy and to France. I want to go to Italy and to France and, uh, you know, all over the world and where the, wherever really good stories lead us and evoking those locations and having fun with our characters in these exotic locations is going to be a real thrill for me, hopefully for you guys too. I think it'll make me want to go there, which is both good and bad. It's delightful, <laughs> but bad for my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I do, do love travel. I mean, yeah. It's a little closer for you, which I'll spend only a moment being jealous about and then move on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I should... I've traveled so little in Europe. I should travel, I, and I will travel a lot more. Well, my last note is again not a question. Now I'm just again <laughs> talking about the book, but <laughs> Stinky's moment in this novel uh, was yes, <laughs> it was very satisfying. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We do sort of love to see him tormented because it just feels like he deserves every minute he of it. Deserve. He's so <laughs> terrible to that 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 girl, Araminta, is that her name? And it, mm -hmm. yeah, he's he's just awful to her. And so what ha what befalls him is so richly deserved. My favorite moment was actually when Baron buries his pants on the spot like a fallen soldier on the battlefield. <laughs> I Thank think you. is the line. I love Thank that. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember Ben saying, yeah, that kind of makes sense. He just buries it. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with this. <laughs> oh, just, that was just so, so excellent. Yeah. Did you feel a little bit sorry for Stinky too? Just a, just a little bit. I yeah. mean, that's a horrible thing to go through. Yeah, yeah exactly. Which is exactly what I want people to feel. Yeah. I think, oh, the poor guy, and then to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I felt bad, but also I liked seeing it happen because he's not, you know, as Lily said, we love to hate him. Yeah. You do, took him down and pegged it too, which is very much needed. But of course. He bounces he was, back. <laughs> yeah, he's straight back to being his insufferable self. So mm -hmm. he's, he's kind of, you don't need to be too sympathetic. Mm -hmm. I felt bad for the near-death experience, but not the subsequent humiliation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was really pleased to introduce Penny or Penelope, <laughs> Persephone. I, for, I can't yes. even remember my own <laughs> characters' names. Never Percy. Penny's <laughs> just about acceptable, yeah. Because she she comes up again in the next book. It's just so great to have given Nevada a mother and to, to make that character more real. I think that that's one of the things that I most enjoyed about this particular book. Yeah, she was wonderful. I did have a laugh, though, because my father used to have a cat named Persephone. <laughs> Such a great name. If I knew a little more about Greek myths and fables, I could probably recount who, exactly who Persephone is. She's the one who gets kidnapped by Hades. Yeah. Okay, yeah, into the underworld. Are mm -hmm. there pomegranates involved in that story? Anyway, mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I absolutely adored her, but could not come up with any questions about her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that she has some of what Nevada has, that sort of effortless style. You know, she's just kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, she's kind of really good. And- Lily texted me when she, when she was reading saying, I want to be Penny when, when I grow oh, yeah. up. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm she's working elegant, on it. She's kind of casually elegant and sophisticated and couldn't mm-hmm. be any other way. And I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. About her and has a wonderful garden. I was very jealous of her garden. <laughs> oh, with all the bees and, and, yeah, yeah. and, yes. and the spirit wandering around it. Right. And now yeah. the other little cat too, who's named um, Almodovar, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, I'm better yeah. on the names of my cats than so <laughs> priorities i have to say i was a little hesitant her, her introduction is a little touchy right she's not on great terms with nevada when she's introduced and obviously i was on nevada's side uh, <laughs> but again seeing that relationship sort of percolate uh, during that that lunch scene was really wonderful and i ended up adoring her well our hero saves the day against all the odds nobody expects him to because he repairs her board <laughs> and- <laughs> And Tinkler can't believe it. Like he just, he can't believe that he's pulled the fat out of the fire like that, but he does. And it's good because we, then we start off with the mother being like really bitchy and, and like lots of tension and like just totally dismiss, dismissing the detectives, the new boyfriend, it's just as a non-entity and being really prickly with her daughter. And then suddenly they build bridges and it's a completely different thing. So we have the fun of seeing both, do both those scenes, which is lovely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And all the honey. <laughs> The honey comes back in the next book too, yeah. That's another merchandising opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we mentioned, the next Final Detective book is being published, hopefully, in May um, of 2022. Fingers yeah. crossed. Can you tell us a little bit about it? We know it's set in Switzerland. Sweden. 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 Yeah. Um, <laughs> Switzerland would be a good place to uh, set in Sweden. Nevada's mother comes back again. Who else is amongst the regular characters is back? Basically, it's the core characters. Our here are four core characters, which is the Nevada and the detective and Agatha and Tinkler go to Sweden. So it's like road trip to Sweden. Yay! There. <laughs> if if Agatha goes with them, who takes care of the cats? That that's where Penny comes in. Oh, okay. So, so she comes <laughs> down, and that, as Tinkler says, so she's coming down to cats at your cats what about her cats and <laughs> they, they, they got miss um marino i know that's not the right name Mar- marina the name means purple in spanish and, and she's the this, the lady who's the headmistress of the school she's going into to penny's place to look after the cats there which particularly makes no sense <laughs> <laughs> she's coming to cat sit somebody has to cat sit for her but that is what is going on and then then we have a little bit of there's that kind of has a plot function too which is a lot of fun well, it sounds like we have more cat content to look forward to. And I'm here for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, I love doing that. And nobody, I don't want to give anybody the impression that these books are like, there are some books that are cat mysteries, which are all about cats. And right. very good. Some of them are too. Like I like Rita Mae Brown, but there's just a judicious little splash and hint and taste of cat now. And then. <laughs> so it's not overdone, but it's an important part of the overall recipe of these books, which I would never leave out. No, it's it's about cat owners. And as I can attest, owning cats does end up being a part of your life. And so not seeing them would feel unrealistic. But instead, we get those furry little monsters. Yeah, the, the furry little monsters are absolutely back. I'm, I'm, I don't want to tell you too much else because i don't want to spoil any any of the fun that i hope is in store for you guys in a well, few that's a, a nice little teaser for the book thank you and it, it is called attack and decay which is a great title <laughs> thank you thank you very much can you tell us a little bit about your current projects you mentioned that you have a play that will hopefully be being put on and you also teased a little bit about a spin-off series right okay so let me let me start sarah by sending you the poster oh i love that poster well thank you like so, that's i i want i want that as a poster framed in my house that's fantastic no, it, it is a glorious piece of artwork uh, I, as your namesake sarah sarah jane docker is the artist who does all the posters for my plays and she's an amazing artist and i'm very very proud of so that is the play that's going on. It's a thriller, as it says there. Ooh. 
It's a thought-provoking thriller about climate change. We've decided that that's kind of the log line for it. And so that'll be, uh, we've booked the theater for May the 2nd for a one week, for the moment, just for a one week run, but if it's a success, we can extend that. And so I have been working on a new play, which I've just finished after that, like Beyond Glacier Lake. And I've just started yet another one because I really, I'm really into doing plays and I'm just loving them so much now, but about the books. So there's another vinyl detective novel underway, which I, the title is Noise Floor. Now, there isn't a contract for this book, so I can't guarantee that there will be a book called Noise Floor out a year from May, but I'm, I'm hoping there will be. Fingers crossed. Um, started working on it, and it's um, I'm having a lot of fun with it because it, I have these books in my head, several books in advance. I've got quite a lot. So this is one I've been looking forward to writing. And this enriched, in the same way that we, in low action, we enriched Nevada's backstory, we're enriching Agatha's backstory, which is quite Ooh. interesting. Yeah, so that's quite fun. And then this other series is, we call it the paperback sleuth, because it's about this person who does the sort of vinyl type thing, but about vintage paperbacks, which is another thing which I love. And there's this character in it, Cordelia, and she she's a paperback detective. Like she, she's a nut about paperbacks, but just how much to tell you. But it, it it overlaps the vinyl detective universe. Perhaps that's all, all I'm going to say for now. And in fact, I'll probably tell you this right up front. She's Stinky's sister. Oh wow! <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> and I, she's not a she's not like a in any way a stainless, blameless person. But she's not as bad as Stinky, and she probably has much the same feeling we do about Stinky. But that's just that's just, and I, I don't think Stinky will even feature in it. But anybody who knows sees that her name's Cordelia Stanmer should be uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> under no illusions that she's not related to Stinky. Uh, and uh, it's it's an interestingly different novel, although it, it does have some, because Agatha turns up in it. Agatha is quite, an, she's not on stage a lot, to put it that way in this novel, but she's an important character in this novel. Mm-hmm. And I think Nevada will probably be in it, but I don't, th- and Tinkler's in it, but the, our hero, the detective, will not be in it. And so there are sort of peripheral characters in it. And the other thing about this series is that the vinyl detective is written in the first person. This is going to be written in what we call the close third person. So Cordelia looked out the window. She was not very pleased with what she saw. That that kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have um, a publication date for this? Is, is there a contract? When can we expect oh, it? Yeah. I want to so the, read it. Absolutely. The, there's a contract. It was supposed to be delivered this week, but... Uh, I've been running slow. Uh, I was running slow anyway. And then when I got COVID, I just thought all bets are off. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I hasten to say that I was, I had very, very mild COVID, but it, it didn't, it, it slowed me down quite a bit. So I am really pleased to know that you're looking forward to this book because that, that, although there's a lump of money that I get paid as soon as I deliver it, it's even more of an incentive to know that you are looking forward to this book. And if I can think that Sarah is looking forward to this book, that'll be a big, um, no, it'll be it'll be really help me to get the book written. And also the people who do my audio books immediately said, we want this book, like sight unseen. And that was such a vote of confidence. Whenever I think, oh, you know, I'm feeling insecure about finishing the book, I thought, I've got to finish it for, for the people who do my audio books, WF House, because they're such nice people and they're so totally into my books. I think I can't let them down. So that, that's so it, much more than money or letting my publisher down. It's letting like letting my readers down, you guys down, or the people, the lovely people who do the audiobooks. That that's what really will motivate me to get this book done, which I hope to have it finished early in, in the new year. Well, I as I mentioned, I'm super excited. I'm a huge book collector, and so this Ooh. sounds like totally my thing. Oh, but it's, it's so much fun because there's all these little details of that world the same way mm-hmm. they are with collecting records like little odd snippets and um sort of the the, the shady world of book dealing which i know mm-hmm. a bit about because i'm mm-hmm. a nut about vintage paperbacks myself so I'm, i'll be writing from a position of love about this yeah well i i cannot wait thank you so much for coming on can you tell us a little bit about where you can be found on the internet for our listeners i i'm most easily found on twitter and facebook just look for Andrew Cartmel. There, there's various Andrew Cartmels with various spellings, but I'm the one who appears in a picture with a cat right beside <laughs> his face. And for anybody who's been listening all the way through, that's Molly, who's, yeah, that, that's effectively 
the cat who is Fanny in, in the Vinyl Detective books. So you, you get to see who that cat is, which is a lot of fun. She's a gorgeous little cat with a pink nose. And that's me. And, um, and if anybody wants to get in touch, that is actually the best way to sort of to, to reach out to me, even if it's only to say, all your books are the same. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I'm very angry. But it did really spur me to do something which I was already in the process of doing, which is trying to make the books as varied as possible while remaining in that same kind of, you know, consistently in that same world. Completely unrelated. I think I realized why people love Tinkler so much. Ooh, do tell. He's very relatable because he loves Agatha almost as much as I do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been just an absolute joy. It's been a pleasure, guys. It's been really nice to like hanging out and talking. Mm -hmm. It's been, I've loved it. Thank you. And hopefully we can talk again soon. You just, all you have to do, Lily, is read some more of my books. (laughs) (laughs) I can do that. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. We are running a fundraiser for the Imagination Library. Uh, Details can be found at fictionfanspodcast.com slash fundraiser. We'll also link to it in the description. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at fictionfanspod. You can also email us at fictionfanspod.gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening. And may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.